first reading is from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, and each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. I'm sorry. I, I was reading from the 15th chapter, not the 16th. Let me start again. Please forgive me. I knew I was wrong. Wow, that's a first. But now I am going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, and you will see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. For those of you that may be visiting today or for those of you that weren't here a couple weeks ago, um, I have been on an 11-day mission trip to Tanzania, and I got back Thursday night. And um, before I left, probably about two and a half weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that, I wrote this sermon. And part of the reason was I was reflecting on when I first started doing mission work, short-term mission, going away and doing mission trips. And... um, This actually goes back to seminary days, because when I was in seminary, um, I had no thought ever of going to the mission field, ever. 
I grew up in a family that was pretty colloquial uh, in Pittsburgh. We never traveled outside the country. And, um, and so that was so far beyond my thinking that I never thought like that. So I get to seminary, and some of you know Betsy Hake. Betsy Hake was in the one-year program in my class. <clears throat> and so Betsy's talking about being in Honduras, going back to Honduras. She's been in Honduras for 40 years. And I'm thinking, that's great. I'm so glad you're called to that ministry. I think that is wonderful. And then a classmate by the name of Kevin Higgins, who's also been here, Kevin's preached here. Kevin uh, is a bishop, Anglican bishop, who was in Pakistan and now is overseeing a mission program out of Fuller, and he trains missionaries, he teaches about mission work, and he um, oversees a mission organization. So these were two of my classmates, and I'm thinking, that is so wonderful that you are called the mission work, because someone needs to do it. In parenthesis, not me. Okay? So that's my thinking at that time. So fast forward, um, in my first position in Pittsburgh, I get called to San Antonio, and I'm serving in San Antonio. This is 1987, and after a couple of months, my the rector, the, my boss, says to me, he says, I want you to start a missions program here, and he says, well, I said, wait, you don't understand. I don't do mission work, and he said to me, you don't understand. I'm making it part of your job. <laughs> so I said, okay, so I started looking into it, and the, probably the most accessible was in the Diocese of northern Mexico, because it was right across the border. And so uh, contacted people that I was able to find that would maybe connect us to a possible mission project. And the first thing we did was we worked at this uh, pretty primitive camp in the mountains outside of Monterey. It's called Allende. And um, my car, I had a stick shift Subaru sedan. It was great. But I almost burnt the clutch out going up and down the mountains on these dirt roads. And... Um, and we get there, and you see this camp, and it's like just not, not nice. It's not in good condition, but you could see the shells and the semblance, and our task was to get it functional and looking nice. And uh, so, you know, we park ourselves in, you know, the cabins, men in one, women in another. I guess there were about 15 of us. I don't remember exactly how many. And uh, we survey, and we decide what it is that's going to be priority in projects, and we discovered a couple other projects while we were there, and it was, it was great in a lot of ways. However, after about two or three days, everybody started not feeling well. And it dawned on us that, okay, here's the well. The well gathers the water, and they pump the well water up to another well, and then it's distributed in the camp. And we're only drinking bottled water and soda, by the way. And so... <clears throat> Um, what we didn't realize is all the, the, the plates and the cups and the silverware were being washed with this water. And on it, this hill up here, part of the gathering, you know, running down the hill, were cows. And everybody got sick. Everybody. And it was pretty ugly for a couple of days till we started taking Cipro and, you know, getting on track. <clears throat> but one woman probably at the time she was in her 40s, maybe around 50, uh, who had gotten so run down, she tripped and fell and broke both of her wrists. And we had to have her medevac out. So this is my first mission trip that I'm in charge of. <laughs> okay? And I got hooked. There was something about being outside of your element and outside of your comfort zone and being with a team of people that you're doing devotions together, you're sharing community together, you're mutually supportive of one another. And amazingly enough, everybody came back so excited about what we had done. And it was like, really? And so that started my journey in mission trips. And I did a number of missions in Monterrey, uh, which is a huge city. I don't know if you know. And very poor in sections. And a lot of people live on the outskirts of the dump there, which is huge. And, um, and Saltillo, which is considered the Athens of Mexico. And I taught evangelism to 45 lay people and five clergy and just had a wonderful time. So in 1992, it was called to St. Luke's and I came here and I decided, of course, we're going to start a missions program. And the first one that I was able to discover through South American Mission Missionary Society, SAMS, was in Honduras. And um, we made a connection with a missionary down there and uh, it was in La Ceiba. Now, I don't know if you know much about Honduras. Some of you know a few things. But Tegucigalpa, which is the capital and it's the center of uh, government and education, university there, 
And then you've got San Pedro Sula, which is the center of agriculture and commerce, where you often fly into as well. But then up on the northern coast, right near Roatan, is this town called La Ceiba. And La Ceiba is known as the party town. So we ended up in the party town. And it was wonderful doing this ministry. And then uh, the following year, that missionary left. So we made a connection in the Dominican Republic where we went for a number of years. And we actually built an orphanage there and uh, helped uh, clean up around a church and paint a church. And it was really a wonderful, wonderful ministry there. And then we got connected to, again, Betsy Hake. And we started going to, 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 to Gusigalpa. And, uh, and then Jericho Ministries. And so we've been doing that ever since, or at least people from our congregation. But about 17 years ago, plus or minus, Bishop Valentine Mukiwa came here, uh, and a friend of mine, a, a bishop, called me up and said, he could really use a break, maybe a long weekend at Hilton Head. Um, is there a place you can find for him and put him up? So we found a place, and he came to church on Sunday, and he heard me preach, and he said, you have to come and teach my clergy. That was 16 years ago. So out of the last 16 years, I've been there 13 times. And this most recent trip was probably the best that I've ever had for a lot of reasons. But I'll get to that. But it's interesting because what I've learned through the years, when I go on these mission trips in anticipation of these mission trips, and, I, and I've shared this before, I'm not in my comfort zone. I didn't grow up traveling internationally, so that's one thing. Travel over the last few years has gotten more challenging in a lot of ways. You know, throw in 9-11 and COVID. And, you know, I'm going to cultures where they don't speak English. Which, like, English is enough of a stretch for me. But then, you know, you're in these cultures where a lot of people speak another language. And in Tanzania, it's Swahili. Particularly when you get to some of the rural areas and outskirts and poor areas, a lot of them don't know English. And, um, and so it's been a challenge through the years, but what I find is every time, every time I get to where I'm going, and I just begin to immerse myself in the culture, it's amazing what the Lord does. It's never exactly what you think it's going to be, by the way. That is always the case. Anywhere I've went, every, everywhere I have gone, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Honduras, even England, and, um, and Tanzania, where I've done ministry, it's never exactly what you think it's going to be. And there's always surprises. But what I've also discovered, when you put yourself in that place, that you're available to the Lord and you're available to the people to whom he sent you, how he just begins to work in you in a way that is different than when I just do ministry here. Because I'm outside my comfort zone, and I just say, Lord, you've got to do this. You've got to help me. You've got to take over in a way that... I, I see him work in amazing ways. And it happens every time. I'm not saying that everybody's called to that. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, we in our culture, in the United States, we get this idea that we're always supposed to be in our comfort zone. We're always supposed to feel like we're in control. That we're doing what we think we should do that oftentimes is going to benefit us. And we can lose sight of that God often calls us outside of that. You know, it's interesting, the call of Isaiah, which is the first reading we have from Isaiah 6 today. When Isaiah was called, what did he say when he experienced the presence and power of the Lord? He said, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Now, granted, it was to his own people. But during his day and during Jesus' day, even though they came, quote-unquote, to their own people, which is what John 1 says about Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's going to be so excited 
about this person who's come to do ministry, that God has called to do this ministry. And oftentimes what you find is they're not. They're not excited. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're very receptive, but not always. And somehow we know that too, so we have a tendency to want to stay in our comfort zone. And yet all of us who are believers are called outside of that. Because we're called to make disciples. We're called to be his witnesses. We're called to walk with him constantly in a culture that isn't always necessarily embracing of who we are and what we do. And that's because we're not called to just gather here. We're not called to just come. Because if you study the life and ministry of Jesus, what does he say? Not only I must go, but you must go. And that's what he says in the upper room with his apostles. I must go. Now what's he talking about? You know, we actually need to back up because the first time he said it is in Mark chapter 1 when he's with Peter and he's at Peter's home and he heals his mother-in-law and he's got this great ministry going because he's healing people and he's preaching and teaching and everybody's responding to him. And he gets up early in the morning and he goes out to a lonely place, as it says, and he prays and he spends time with the Father. And when the apostles find him and say, everybody's looking for you, everybody wants you to come and spend time with them and fellowship and do ministry, he says, I must go to other cities and other towns because I came to preach and teach. I came to announce the kingdom of God. I came to bring the good news to people. And when he says, I must go in the upper room, twofold. Number one, he says, I must go because he's going to the cross. Not exactly a pleasant thought. Not exactly what he even wanted to do. Because he would say in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. But his going was often because he loved the Father and wanted to be obedient. Because he loves us and wanted to be our Savior and Lord. And so he gave himself, but he had to go. But the I must go also has to do with ascending to the Father. Because it's when he ascends to the Father, as he says, he can send the Holy Spirit then. The Holy Spirit would be his presence now. His Holy Spirit that would be everywhere. His Holy Spirit that could live in in each one of us, dwell with all of us, unite us together with one another, empower us for ministry, change us and bear fruit. The Holy Spirit is what we need to live the life that he calls us to. And then beyond that, Matthew 28, when he's about to ascend, he says, you must go. Go and make disciples. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now let me tell you, I came to an understanding more and more of what that meant. Because when I first felt this call to ministry, my mindset really was, I will never leave Pittsburgh. I mean, who would want to? <laughs> it's Jerusalem. Sort of. That's what I thought. But God had other things in mind. I mean, going to San Antonio, that was like Judea, if not Samaria. <laughs> and then coming to Hilton Head. Talk about really roughing it. No, this has been great. <laughs> but I mean, the Lord has called me to different places, but then to the ends of the earth. I really didn't understand what that meant until the combination of San Antonio and then coming here. That the Lord expanded that. And I understood more and more what it meant and what it means to go. 
I never liked the travel, but I always loved the ministry. Because I watch him work. And it's wonderful to be a part of that. To know his presence that way in a, in a different way. And he says, and I will guide you in all the truth. See, that's a challenging one today. Because everybody has their own truth. But when we go equipped with the Holy Spirit, we have to share. Because we want people to know the truth about God, the truth about his love, the truth about what Jesus did. We want them to know. We want them to experience the blessing that God has for them. The comfort, the strength, the peace, the guidance that we've experienced. You know, it's really interesting. Usually when I go to Tanzania, I'm with a team of people. And even though I'm not always around them all the time because I'm doing clergy conferences and I'm preaching, at least there's the team there. But when I got there, I was by myself. I was by myself till the last day I was there. And it was an interesting experience because I'm kind of outgoing. And so when I stay in a hotel, I say hi to everyone and I talk to people and, and, and it's just who I am. So the first couple of nights I'm in Dar and then I fly to Bukoba and go to Bihar Mulo and I do a clergy conference there, which was really different because um, it is the youngest diocese, the smallest diocese, and uh, the bishop is the youngest bishop and it's the poorest diocese. And so the blessing was the church mouse gave a grant that paid for transportation, food, lodging for the clergy. And so they were able to come. Almost all of them came. 35. Not a big group. But it was wonderful. I stayed in what would be a rundown Motel 6. No hot water. Not wonderful, but doable. I can do that. I haven't taken a cold shower in a while. It was good. <laughs> but then I came back to Dar. And when I came back, it was really interesting. The bellhops and, and the waitresses and the hostess. And you're back. It's great to see you. And here's why. Because the first day I was there in the dining hall and I'm talking to people, the hostess came over and she talked to me for a little bit. And I said, tell me about yourself. And she told me. And I said, let me pray for you. So in the dining hall, I just reached out and grabbed her hand and prayed for her. So then this waitress, Hawa, Muslim, by the way, sees this. She comes over. I got a collar on. So she knows I'm a Christian. And she said, can I tell you something about me? And she told me, and she said, can you pray for me? So I prayed for her. Well, everybody in the dining room is watching this stuff going on. See, but we're called to be salt and light wherever we are. And so word, of course, gets out to all the staff. You know, there's five dining rooms. There's, this is a nice place, by the way. And completely different than the other motel. And everybody was so friendly to me. So I want to fast forward. I'll get to other stuff, but I want to fast forward. Joni Vanderslice, who's the head of the board of the Valentine Children's Home, the orphanage we started there, came the last day because we needed to meet with the bishop and... Uh, and Gal, who's the director of the preschool now, and, and talk about some things, and then we would get together um, uh, another time. But anyway, the long and the short of it is, when I walk into breakfast, she and her husband are there, and I walk in, and the waitresses are saying hi, and the hostess and the waitress are giving me a hug, and I'm walking over the table, and they looked at me, and they said, do you know everybody here? <laughs> and it was, you know, I didn't think about it, I didn't realize it, that's what it means to be salt and light. That we're just supposed to be who we are in Christ. And to be a witness by our words and how we act. And apparently, they caught that. And it was a wonderful, wonderful thing just to see through Joni's eyes that everybody was responding in a positive way to the fact that I was there. 
and I just treated them all kindly. Because I'd say, you know, tell me your name, and I'd talk to them for a little bit, different lengths with different people. That's what I'm talking about. That you're outside your comfort zone, but you're meant to be God's person at that place. And it was just such a great experience to just be there because they were so nice to me. And they said, we hope you come back next year. I said, we'll pray about that one. <laughs> you know, we'll see what the Lord has in mind. But it was really a great, great time. But I sought to bring Christ's truth. When I prayed with this Muslim waitress, I prayed in the name of Jesus. She knows. And we talked about what it is that he can do for her. We're all called to do that wherever we are, frankly. But when Jesus and Paul both spoke, they talked about essentially speaking the truth in love. And learning how to do that in whatever environment, wherever we find ourselves, is what God wants us to do. It's how we begin to make a difference in people's lives. And Jesus said also, all that the Father has given to me, I will give to you. Now see, when we think about being given things by God, oftentimes our mind wanders to being blessed by God, which means things. Those are the kind of blessings we often think about. But see, everything in this world is temporal, temporary. And temporarily ours, especially since we're only stewards here because we're going to be leaving here. Everything in this world, of this world, is temporary. When Jesus says, everything, God has given me everything. My Father, because he loves me, has given, and I give it to you. The presence and power of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the ability to bring the truth into people's lives. He gives us all that, and that never leaves. That's eternal. That's eternal. That's what he's talking about. Which is why he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Go therefore and make disciples. Why? Because we now have his authority. We now go out as if Jesus, that's why we're called Christians, into the world. And that's what we're called to do. You know, Jesus never really had a really nice home that was his. He went around as an itinerant preacher relying on the generosity of other people, the care. Because he did not hold on to this world and things tightly. We tend to. We tend to. But when we hold on to them lightly, it's such a blessing. And that's what Jesus did. You know, going back to the church mouse and giving a grant, I have to tell you what happened when I ended up back in Dar es Salaam. But this actually began before I left. I got there Monday night at one in the morning. Tuesday morning, I had wonderful quiet time with the Lord. And at a leisurely morning, and I was going over my notes, and I get a call from the Bishop of Dar. And he calls me up, and he says, um, how you doing? Everything going well? Yes. Um, I want to let you know a couple things. First of all, you're preaching in the cathedral on Sunday. Okay. I need some scriptures in order to do that so I can write a sermon. Now, that, that's not so much a big deal because twice in my 13 trips over there, I've gotten to the cathedral and the provost, the head pastor, says to me, oh, you're here, you're preaching. And so 15 minutes before the service, I said, give me your office, give me the scriptures, I'll write a sermon. And I've done that. I've preached. So having five days was no big deal to write a sermon, particularly since all I have to do at this point is just go over my notes and catch a flight for Bihar Mullah the next day. And then he says to me, because he had scholarship money from the church mouse, that um, 
that there were going to be so many clergy and so many evangelists coming to this conference, he had to break it up into two days. So I had the clergy one day and the evangelists the next day. I had written over two days worth of material for the clergy and evangelists together. Because in Bihar Mulo, I didn't get through all my notes that I wanted to teach them. So I'm thinking, okay, so now I got to revamp my talk for the clergy for a one day instead of a two day teaching, six hours each day. And then I've got to somehow figure it out for the evangelists. Now, let me tell you something about the evangelists in Tanzania. The evangelists are the lay church planters. They are lay people like you. They're not ordained. And they help plant churches over there. Last year, they planted 20 churches in the Diocese of Dar es Salaam. They begin small, rural, and then eventually when they begin to grow, clergy will come in periodically. And they also help the existing churches grow. And so the first day of the seminar, I had over 100 clergy there that I spoke to. The second day when I had the evangelists, I had over 200 evangelists there. I had to re-gear my talk for lay people who were doing church planting and church growth, not just clergy. And if you would have looked at both crowds, they could not have all fit in the church where I was teaching. And that's what the bishop said, you have to break it down into two days and you have to figure out how to talk to both groups. With the same notes, by the way. And it went wonderfully well. It was incredible. It was such a blessing for me and for all the people that came. And once again, the bishop said, you have to come back. And I said, well, I'll pray about it. He said, I know one way. We'll make you a citizen here. <laughs> <laughs> but we had dinner that night at his home. And there was another bishop there. And he was originally from Zanzibar. In fact, both the Bishop of Dar and this bishop were both assistants on the staff at the cathedral in Zanzibar. And when I walked in the door and I came into the light, this bishop from Zanzibar, not from Zanzibar, that's where he was from originally, he looks at me and he says, you were in the cathedral 13 years ago, weren't you? I mean, I met him for like 10 minutes. And he remembered. I didn't. He did. I mean, the way the Lord does things in your life is just amazing. That was such a blessed trip in so many ways, I can't tell you. And it's because people hold on to things lightly and they donate it to the church mouse. And then the church mouse has all these funds to be able to give to local outreach and to mission work. And because of that, we had lots of people hear about what it means to be not only a Christian, but a Christian leader. A Christian leader as a pastor, a Christian leader as one who plants churches and grows churches. It was wonderful. And probably one of the most special trips I've had. How the Lord used that time and blessed me and the, and the people there was amazing. It's just amazing. You know, our bishop, Chip Edgar, was here three weeks ago. And when he spoke, he talked about how when people hear the gospel, and sometimes when people share the gospel, all they talk about is being blessed and being healthy and having everything you need. And we sometimes lose sight of that's not what this call to follow Christ is about. Because if you study the life of Christ and you study the life of the apostles, it is far different than that. It is constantly being a witness for him. It is constantly be av being available for his spirit to use you to touch lives and give yourself away. To serve him and serve others. And when we think it's only about us, we miss the point. We miss the point. Because if God's spirit lives in us and God's love lives in us, we will overflow onto other people. That much like Jesus, we will want to go. And going might just be to a neighbor or to a friend or to a family member. 
Going might mean when you're in a grocery store or you're in a restaurant that you become salt and light for people. Going means that you don't just talk about your faith here and you don't just live the life of Christ here. You take the life of Christ wherever you are. And sometimes you will be outside your comfort zone. And oh, by the way, that doesn't mean that you're always going to be effective or successful. You know, Isaiah had this call. He had this incredible encounter with the Lord in the temple. He had this call. And a coal touches his lips and the Lord says, who can I send? And he says, here I am, send me, I'm ready, take me, I can go. Here's what the Lord said to him. This is also Isaiah 6. Whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And he said, here am I, send me. So he said, God said, go and say to this people, keep listening, but you won't comprehend. Keep looking, but you won't understand. Make the mind of this people dull and stop their ears and shut their eyes that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? He said, until the cities lie in waste without inhabitants and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate. In other words, you need to spread my truth. And what's going to happen is these people just aren't going to listen. They're just not going to respond. They're not going to follow. And then judgment's going to come on the land. And what's going to happen after that? They're going to remember what you said and they're going to repent and they're going to come to me. Because that's what they need to wake up. Now I pray that's not what's going to happen to our country. But I know one thing. Unless they know the truth, unless we are salt and light, unless we are his witnesses, and unless we go out into the world, into the community, and we are his salt and light, that could be where this country's heading. We need to take the call that he has on our lives seriously to go. Let's pray. Lord God, you certainly, when you sent your son, did not send him into a comfort zone. You sent him to be the Savior and the Lord, the one who would walk among us simply, without many worldly comforts, without worldly security, but simply trusting you for your provision, for your spirit, so that we might have a Savior and we might know him as Lord. That we would see the depth of your love in your son Jesus and then be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to take seriously this call to be salt and light. To be the ones who don't just stay here where it's comfortable, but we go. And we reach out to a world that is broken, that has needs, spiritually, materially, emotionally. That we might speak your truth in love, be a testimony and a witness, be your vessels that people might come to know you because we've gone out in your name, equipped by your spirit to love and to serve. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.